Welcome to your first Explain Everything video. Um, I'm hoping that we're gonna make a series of these for you to watch before you learn new procedures in the BMS 645 hematology lab. So the first one we're gonna go over is the process for smear making and slide staining. So I've created these videos within this video to help you get an idea of the technique. So the first one that we're gonna look at is smear making. So let's get some of these out of the way and let's take a look at what we did okay so today we are going to go over the wedge prep method for smear making and then after we do this we're going to go through the steps for slide staining but before you can stain slides you have to have actually made slides so you will have done a pre-lab worksheet before you get to lab so you will be familiar with this we'll watch the video so you'll know kind of what you're doing and what you're getting yourself into the very first thing that you need is the equipment to actually make your slides. So the first thing you're going to have is a nice tube of well-mixed blood. That's already be on the mixer for you. You'll be all set to go with that. The other thing you're going to need are two slides. One of these slides we're going to call our specimen or our smear slide. And the other one we're going to call our spreader slide. Before you start making smears, you have to think about four different variables. So the first variable that we really care about is our angle. When I talk about angle, I'm going to go through all of these individually, so we'll talk about the four first, and then I'll go into them in detail. So the first variable is angle, second variable is pressure, third variable is speed, and the fourth variable is the size of the drop that you're using. So when we talk about the angle, we're talking about the angle of our spreader slide in relation to the specimen slide. So it's the angle of this slide hovering over the slide where you put your specimen and that you're going to actually make your slide on. The angle that we really want is about a 30 to 45 degree. So in relation to my specimen slide, I want my spreader slide at about 30 to 45 degrees. If I have too high of an angle, so more than 45 degrees, I'm going to end up with a really short, squat, fat, yucky smear. But if I have lower than 30 degrees, I'm going to end up with a really long, thin, flowy, takes forever to get anywhere kind of smear. The second thing that we want to talk about is pressure. When we're talking about the pressure, we're talking about the pressure of our spreader slide on our specimen slide. So this is talking about whether you're like barely touching your specimen slide or whether you're like jamming that thing way the heck in there. What we're looking for is really an even and consistent pressure that runs from the entire length of our specimen slide. So you don't want like jerky kind of movements where like suddenly you're light and then you're like jamming it down there and then you're really light and then you're jamming it in again. You want something that's nice and even and fluid. If you use too much pressure, so I'm really like jamming this thing down there, then you're gonna end up with short, jagged smears, and there's also the potential that you could just break your spreader slide, which would send shards of glass flying into your neighbor's faces, and they will probably not appreciate that. If you don't use enough pressure, right, so if I'm just kinda like barely touching my slide, your slides are gonna be super long and watery, and they're not gonna be useful. The other piece that's sort of related to your pressure is your speed. So again, with speed, what we're looking for is something that is even and consistent. You don't want to like start out really fast and then be like, oh wait, maybe that's too fast, and then go really, really slowly. So you want something that's really even, okay, the whole way through. If you use too much speed, so you're really just like flying across that, you're going to end up with a short, thick smear. If you go too slow, not only are you going to be in lab for the next six hours, but it's also going to be a very long and thin smear. Um, the last variable is the size of the drop of blood that you put onto the specimen slide. So this should be fairly self-explanatory. If you use a big drop of blood, you're going to have a really thick, goopy slide. If you use a little dinky drop of blood, you're going to have a little dinky slide. So you, the ideal um, size is, a, is about a one to two millimeter drop. You want to place it about an inch up from the edge of your slide. So. There's only so long that we can talk about these things before we actually start doing them. So let's go through um, some examples and then I'll show you how we actually make them. So if I look at 
these smears here that I created earlier. You can see them a little bit better on this white backdrop. Can you see them okay? Yep. Okay. Um, so this <laughs> smear right here, this is a good smear. So if you look at this smear, you've got kind of like this flat back line and then you've got this nice rounded edge at the top here. This is something that we call the feathered edge. And I'm going to explain why this feathered edge is so important um, in a little bit. But this is really the ultimate goal of what you're shooting for when you make your smears. This one that we have here, this is what I would consider a little short dinky smear. So this smear is not good for several reasons. It's too short, right? It's not wide enough. And it's too thick. I would not want to look at this smear because everything in here would be really jammed together and it would be really difficult for me to be able to discern cell morphologies. This smear is really long and really, really thin, so it's going to take me forever to find an area where I'm getting a good, represent good representation of cell morphology. You can also tell here that there's sort of like these spiky ends at the top. These are really, in particular, very bad because they sort of get, um, the cells get really spread out from each other and they get kind of flattened. So it's very difficult to tell what the morphologies of the cells are here because mostly everything here is going to look like a big, fat artifact. There's also this thing at the top here that we like to call a flat top. The flat top is impossible to look at because the flat top looks exactly like this really, really thick area down here. Everything is just jammed right in there together, and there's no way to really be able to uh, differentiate one cell from the next because they just look like one big mess. This is also a really bad example. So in this one, you can see there's almost like these little particles that are kind of stuck inside the smear. So I will tell you right now that this was from a smear that I made when I used way too much pressure. Using too much pressure chipped off pieces of the end of my spreader slide when I made it. And so these are actually little tiny chips of glass that are embedded into the slide. So this is going to like burst open a whole bunch of my cells and make it really difficult for me to get an accurate representation of what it looks like in that person's blood. So these three, bad. This one, good. But when, I, when you make these smears in lab today, I want you to not only try to make good ones, but I also want you to purposely make bad ones because it will help you to figure out, oh, well, that one was too fast or that was too slow or I used too much pressure or I didn't use enough pressure. I also want you to be thinking about how these three smears could have come about. So what kinds of variables could have happened? Did I go too slow? Did I go too fast? Did I have the, you know, too much of an angle, too little of an angle to create these smears? Because these are the kinds of questions that I'm going to ask you when we get to quiz one. So let's go ahead and I'll show you how to actually make a smear. So the first thing you need, specimen slide, oops, spreader slide, you got to have some gauze. I recommend like two little piles and that way in case something happens to one, you still got a backup and you don't have blood all over the place and reaching around for things. And then you also need what we call a capillary tube or a micro hematocrit tube. I'll, we're going to talk more about those um, in later weeks of lab, but for now, this is what you need them for. So we're going to take our well-mixed tube of blood. We want to avoid aerosols here. I would prefer that nobody, you know, splash a whole bunch of blood into their eyeballs. Um, and so what we're going to do, I'm going to put my goggles on so that I am safe too. Okay. We are going to always uncap our tube of blood behind a shield. So I'm going to grab a few pieces of gauze, and I'm going to kind of twist and pull on the cap. I'm going to leave that to the side. I'm going to grab my capillary tube. Now everybody here is going to like collectively freak out because I'm going to pretty much hold my tube of blood sideways. So you're going to think, oh my god, she's dumping this all over the place. But in reality, I'm going to hold my tube pretty much sideways and my capillary tube sideways. I'm going to stick the capillary tube in, and you'll start to see that there will be blood flowing into the capillary tube. If you try to do this vertically, it will not work. You need to have both items pretty much horizontally in order for your capillary tube to fill. I'm going to go ahead and recap my tube, make sure that's on there good and tight, and then I'm going to stick it back on the rocker so that it can keep rocking. 
I'm going to gently wipe down my capillary tube so that I can get off any of the excess blood that's on the outside. And now I'm going to start making some smears. So when you guys start making your smears, I don't recommend that you try to make more than one at a time because you're going to have too many things that you're trying to think about in terms of how to do this. So I recommend start with one. So I'm going to put just about a one to two millimeter drop of blood about an inch up from the end of my specimen slide. Grab your spreader slide. I tend to hold mine just with one finger on the end of the specimen slide. Some people will hold it back here, some people do this. It doesn't matter. Do whatever works for you and whatever makes you feel comfortable when you do it. I'm going to start, we call this the wedge prep method because I want to create a wedge between, I'm sort of sandwiching my drop of blood in a wedge between my, spre my spreader slide and my specimen slide. So I want to start with my spreader slide about halfway down the specimen slide beyond the point where you put your blood, okay? The blood should always be in a wedge between your spreader slide and your specimen slide. You're not starting from back here and then pushing. Always starting beyond, pulling back, and then pushing. So we're going to start at about a 30 to 45 degree angle, and you can notice I'm holding my spreader slide in between thumb, forefinger, and middle finger. So I'm going to start here about halfway down. I'm going to pull my, spe my spreader slide back just until it touches this drop of blood. When I touch this drop of blood, you're going to notice I'm going to hang out here for a minute. I'm going to hang out here for a minute because I want this drop of blood to start flowing to either end of my spreader slide. Once it gets to just inside the edges of the spreader slide, then I'm going to go ahead and push my specimen off but not until then. I don't want to go too early. I want my smear to go almost to the edges of my specimen slide. And so there we go. So not, not a perfect example, but pretty good. Once that dries, we'll be able to see it. So let's grab another slide. I'll show you another example. We'll make another good one. So one to two millimeter drop of blood, about an inch up. Grab your spreader slide, 30 to 45 degree angle, halfway up your specimen slide. Pull back till you hit that drop, wait for it to hit both ends, and then push. And we'll show you when those dry, we'll, we'll show you what those look like. Let's do one more here. So that drop looks like it might be a little bit big for what I usually use, but it'll work. It'll make it work. Halfway up my specimen slide, 30 to 45 degree angle. I'm going to hit that drop, wait, and then go. That bad boy's perfect. So, all right, we'll let, we'll let those dry for a minute, and then um, we can kind of show you what those look like. So we'll add them to our collection of, of good smears. So remember that what we're looking for is that nice feathered edge that doesn't have long streaks like this guy, right? He's got this like kind of comet-like tail coming out. That's bad. We don't want any of that. We don't want any flat top either, right? We're not looking for a crew cut. This is not how that goes. So we want this nice little feathered edge that you can see that's developing on all of these slides right here. And that's how we're going to make smears. You're going to make probably 60 of them today, and probably three of them will be good. So don't be alarmed by the fact that you're making a ton of smears and they look like garbage. That's the way that you learn, and that's not a bad thing because it teaches you how to do it incorrectly so that you can do it correctly. And we're done. Okay, so that's the process of how you actually make smears. So the other thing that I want to teach you about um, what happens with the smear making process is why it's so important to create that feathered edge that I was talking about. So. Remember that I said, so here's what we're going to start with, right? Here's our little drop of blood that we've added to the end of our smear. When you bring that spreader slide onto your drop of blood, you are waiting here until you can visually see this drop of blood spreading out on both sides of your spreader slide. You want to let this spread until it's, you know, I don't know, maybe just a hair in from the edge of your smear. The reason that you don't want to get all the way to... Um, the edge of the smear here, why you don't want to let your blood go all the way down to this edge here or this edge here, is because if you do, you will lose focus on uh, the scope 
and you won't be able to see those cells that are at the very edge of your smear. Um, so we want to stop it before we get there. So what we're going to do instead is stop when we get right out, I don't know, somewhere around here towards the edge of our smear. Then we're going to push forward and we're going to make our little nice looking feathered edge here. So we have this principle um, that we talk about when we are making smears called margination. And margination is the reason for why we want to make sure that we have um, a feathered edge at the end of our cells. Margination is the tendency for larger cells to be found or pushed to the periphery of the smear with smaller cells in the middle. So what happens is that on the outside here in our feathered edge, we are getting the biggest cells. So these would be things like your monocytes, your eosinophils, your neutrophils. There's a greater tendency for them to be found on the outside peripheral edges of the cell or of the smear. And there's a greater tendency for smaller cells like lymphocytes and platelets and things like that to be found in the central area of the smell of the, of the smear. So when we are making a smear, if we have a feathered edge like this, it helps to decrease the amount of margination that we have present. If you have a, um, if you have a, a, a smear and it's got all these really long, spiky, pointy edges like that, then it's a greater tendency for the bigger cells to be found here and then your little cells are in here. But you can't count both of these areas at the same time when you do a differential. So it makes it very inaccurate. So the more margination that you have, the greater the tendency of cells to be on the out, larger cells to be on the outside and smaller cells to be on the inside, the more error that you have in your differential. Um, so when we are reviewing our smear, we are looking at the feathered edge because that is an area of perfect cell distribution that's at the end of our smear. We want to look from the thick to the thin end um, in the feathered edge and really where we are going to look is about a fourth to a fifth of the way in from the feathered edge. So you're talking about sort of like here-ish. This general region is where you're kind of going to start doing your differential. When you start doing your differential, you are going to do it in what we call a serpentine fashion. So let's say that you start here. This is your little starting point uh, when you do your differential. This is the first field that you look at. You're going to come all the way up until you hit the very edge of your smear. Then you're going to move immediately one field over. You are not skipping around to the next field to the right that you feel like looking at. You are going one field over. Then you're going to look and count all of the white cells that you see there, and you're going to analyze all of the red cells and the platelets that are in that field for any abnormalities that you see. Then you're going to come down, and you're going to go all the way down to the next feathered edge. Then once you get there, if you still haven't hit 100 cells, you're going to move one field over again. Then you're going to come back up, then you're going to go over, then you're going to go back down, and then you're going to go over, and then you're going to keep doing that. So you're going to keep doing that serpentine fashion for as many um, fields as it takes you to count the first consecutive 100 white blood cells that you see on that smear. Um, and you're also going to be looking at that RBC and platelet morphology as you do that. So now that you have got your smears and you've got them created. Whoops, I remember not to do that. Come on. Um, what we're gonna do now is take a look at this video for, come on. Let's take a look at this video for smear making and slide staining so that you can get the idea of how you are supposed to stain your slides now that you have them created. Okay. I'm always going. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so we've made our uh, we've made our smears, and now it's time to stain them so that we can start looking at peripheral blood morphology and determine if there are normal or abnormal things going on on our patient's smear. You've done a pre-lab write-up about this, just like you did with slide with slide making. So we should already know kind of what you're getting yourself into here. Um, but we are going to use something today called right stain. Right stain consists of two components. The first one is something called methylene blue, and the second is eosin. 
We're going to talk about what each of those are. So methylene, when we talk about stains, the first thing for you to keep in mind and remember is that opposites attract. It's kind of like magnets where north and north don't go together, it's north and south that like to hang out. Um, the same is true when we talk about acids and bases in terms of stains. So our first component is methylene blue, and methylene blue is the blue portion of what you can see in a right stain. Methylene blue is what we consider to be a basic stain. It stains the portions of cells that like bases. The portions of cells that like bases are things that we would call basophilic or base loving. So in our world of opposites attract, what would like bases? Would bases like bases? No, because that wouldn't make any sense. So acids like bases. So acids would be things like DNA or RNA, mostly the things that we think about in the contents of our cell nuclei. So methylene blue, basic stain, stains basophilic portions of cells, which are the acids, which are your RNA and your DNA in the nucleus. The second component of right stain is eosin. Eosin is sort of invisible in the right stain, because if you look at this, you can't really see any red, right? But eosin is this really beautiful sort of red-orange color, and it is an acid stain. So this is going to stain the portions of cells that love acids, which we would consider to be acidophilic portions of cells. So in our world of opposites attract, what would love acids, not more acids, right? It would be bases. Bases would love acids. So the primary basic components of our cells that are going to stain with eosin are things like hemoglobin, eosin granules, and other cytoplasmic granules. Um, so primarily the things that are going to stain with eosin are things that are in the cytoplasm of our cells. So eosin, acidic stain, which is going to stain the um, portions of the cell that love acids, which would be acidophilic, which would be the bases, which would be hemoglobin, and cytoplasmic granules. So when we make or when we stain our slides, um, the first thing that we're going to do is make sure that you have a nice dried smear that you have made because you've now perfected your technique. And then we're going to add it to the stain for two minutes, and then we're going to put it in a buffer for five minutes. Our smears um, are going to have been made from blood that has been collected with EDTA, which is our primary anticoagulant that we use in hematology. And EDTA stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, which you will have glued into your, into your faces by about week two of the semester. Um, typically, we say that, that cells are good for about 24 hours when collected in EDTA, but that will sort of change from facility to facility, so you need to pay attention to wherever you go for how long they will allow smears to be made from an EDTA blood smear. So when we stain, there are two different ways that we can do it. The first one is something called the Copland jars, which is what I'm going to show you today. And then we also have staining bars, which I will probably talk about in lab, but you will probably not actually do. When we stain things in our Copland jars, Copland jars are really kind of neat because they have, oh, how best you can see this, but they have these cool little troughs right here. So these troughs are sort of like little lanes that your smears can sit in while they're being stained. So if I put my smear in here into these, oops, into the troughs, you can kind of see how it sits in between those two, and if I wiggle it back and forth, it can't go very far. So the troughs really help to make sure that there is sort of surface area where your um, smear can be touching the stain or the buffer, and also prevents it from touching other people's smears. However, it's only effective at preventing you from touching other people's smears if other people don't put their smears in the same trough as yours, okay? So don't do that because your friends won't like you then. So when we use right stain, one of the very most important things is to make sure that you have really, really, really well mixed right stain, okay? Um, this is also one of the sort of most important pieces in hematology labs. So when we do um, slide staining, you will always have fresh right stain. This is the middle of summer, and so I have not ordered you right stain yet, um, but you will have a fresh jar of this because I, I, it is really important that this be in date because otherwise it does affect the quality of your smears. So you should always shake your right stain for about 60 seconds, so first thing. Cap on tight, because otherwise we make a big mess. And then you just shake away forever. 
Um, you know, just keep shaking and shaking and shaking. So I'm not going to waste 60 seconds of video by shaking right seam, but this is what we're going to do every single time we do this. So once it's nice and well mixed and I feel good about that, I'm going to uncap and then I'm going to pour into my Coplin jars. I'm going to fill my Coplin jar probably two thirds of the way full. Just kind of covering the trough. You don't really need to cover it um, to fill it any more than that. And then it's really important that you recap your right stain immediately. What's really, why it's really important to do this is because the, the methanol that is in um, the right stain, which acts as a fixative, is anhydrous methanol. So anhydrous means that it is without water, and that's the way we want to keep it. If we were to leave this uncapped, it would be able to suck in sort of moisture that's from the air and it would no longer be anhydrous and that would affect the quality of the methanol as a fixative. So what do I mean when I call it a fixative? What the heck is that? A fixative is an alcohol or other substance that helps to adhere the cells onto our slide. So right now you might be saying, well yeah, but aren't they already kind of adhered to the slide? Not really. They're dried, but they're not really like stuck on there. There's no like chemical reaction that has happened to want to make those cells stick to this glass surface. That's what a fixative does. The fixative makes it so that these cells are permanently, they're like perma bonded to this glass slide. So I've got um, my stain all poured out, time to get some buffer. Now I could be super fancy and order you like correctly pH balanced 7.6 phosphate buffer blah blah blah. But in reality, I don't think there's any need to do that because we have found in historical experience that tap water works just fine. So I'm just going to take my Coplin jar and now I'm just going to fill it right up from the sink. So ta-da, buffer. So I'm also going to cover my buffer because I tend to be clumsy and when I knock that over I'm going to be pretty annoyed with myself. So we're just going to leave that nice and covered. Um, so when you use any substance that you have poured off from a primary tube um, or anything that you've aliquoted, you're always going to label it. I always want you to label with whatever the name of the substance is and then also with your initials and the date that you did it. So you could technically hold me in default for doing this incorrectly, um, but I didn't put my initials or the date on here because I wanted you to be able to kind of see what was going on with each of these jars. But when you do it, you will always do the name of the substance, your initials, and the date. So first thing that we're going to do when we stain, we're going to open carefully our methylene blue. We're going to take our dried smear and we are going to insert it into the trough. We're going to immediately recover our Coplin jar because we don't want to let any extra moisture in and then we're going to let this sit for two minutes. So during the two minutes that that slide is in here, you're thinking to yourself, great, this thing's staining and I'm good to go. Great. Okay. Mission accomplished. But in actuality, there's no staining that's taking place in the staining jar. What's happening in the stain jar is a step that we call fixation. So fixation is what's happening when the methanol that's in the right stain is actually taking the cells and sticking them right onto that glass slide. So that's what's happening here. Even though it looks like it should be staining because you have it in the stain and because it looks blue, that's not what's happening. The only thing that's happening here is that your cells are getting stuck to the slide. If you were to take this out, dry it, and look at it under the microscope, your cells would not be stained. So, boop, 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 magic, two minutes is up. So we're going to take our slide out from the troughs, and you can see that it's nice and blue. And I'm going to just kind of like run it along the edge here gently, just kind of getting off a little bit of that extra stain, just returning it to its home. And then right from there, I'm going right into the troughs in my buffer. Again, I'm going to put the cap on because I don't want to knock this over, and I'm going to recap my stain, super important. So this is going to sit for five minutes in the buffer. And now this, contrary to popular belief, is the step that's actually staining your cells. So you can see if you look in here, you can see that there's sort of like a purple layer that's kind of around your slide. That is residual stain. So when we took it out from the stain jar, we saw that there was like a layer of like purpley blue that was kind of stuck on the surface of your smear, and that stayed with it when we went to the buffer. 
that residual stain is what's being acted on by the buffer. So the buffer is sort of allowing the cells that are now stuck to the surface to take that residual stain and like eat it all up. So the acidic pieces of the cell, the RNA and the DNA, those are eating up the basic stain. Those are eating up methylene blue. The basic portions of um, the cells, the hemoglobin, the eosin granules, those are the um, acidophilic portions of the cell. Those are eating up the acid stain, the eosin. Okay, so that's what's happening while we're in, in this jar. So, boop, 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 more magic. Five minutes is now up. So I'm going to take my smear out. And again, I'm just going to kind of run it along the edge and just return some of that nice magical buffer slash tap water right back to its home. I'm going to recap this. And now you can see, you can see it's kind of purple. But it's also looking kind of nasty, right? You can actually probably see some of that stuff just like draining right off of it. What I want to do now is get rid of some of this. So there's excess stuff in here. So what I'm going to do is just rinse it gently underneath the sink, just for a second or so. Just kind of washing off, just washing it off. And now, if I hold it up, see how it's not really grainy? See how it's, it, it looks just nice and clean and purple and looks pretty good? So now what you want to do is you want to put it to dry at an angle. What this does is allows the excess moisture to kind of drip off the slide because you don't want it to pool on the area where your specimen actually is. If it pools there, then you won't be able to see anything. You're going to get a lot of water artifact on your slide and it's going to be difficult for you to read. So if you lay it at an angle and let it dry, you'll get the best quality specimen to be able to look at. This will take a while, so you have to be patient. But once it's done, we're going to take them to the microscopes and then we're going to examine blood morphologies and look for normal and abnormal things. Okay, so I hope that you found those helpful um, and that they give you a good introduction to what we're going to be doing in lab today or whatever day that you actually watch this. Um, and if you have any questions or any feedback about these videos, please let me know because I am new to using Explain Everything and I want to kind of make it um, a really cool interactive learning process for you. So I will see you in lab. Don't forget to bring your pre-lab worksheets and we will go over everything then.